copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Seattle Police calling all cars. Attention all cars to broadcast 257 regarding a bombing. Be on the lookout for two men carrying 2,000 sticks of dynamite. That is all. Harm on. An autobiography is an account of the life of a man written by himself. A biography is the life story of a man written by someone else and usually contains the honest, unprejudiced views of one who knows his subject from A to Z and tells the truth without fear or favor. The story of Rio Grande Crack Friends is being written by outside authorities. The men at the wheels of your police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about Rio Grande Crack when by their continued reliance upon this better motor fuel, they say... Real Grande Cracked is the gasoline of real police car performance. They drive the most and are qualified to know that... Real Grande Cracked starts quicker, accelerates more smoothly, and packs more speed, power, and mileage in every gallon. That, friends, is the story of this superior gasoline. The true story told by city, county, state of California, and federal government officials. Verified by tens of thousands of motorists who have checked the facts for themselves. If you haven't done so, prove it to yourself. Get a supply of police car performance Rio Grande Crack at your nearest red and white Rio Grande station in the morning. And you'll understand why Rio Grande Crack is the most highly recommended public serving gasoline sold in the West. Facts in tonight's story are to be found in the confidential files of the Police Department of Seattle, Washington. We have therefore asked Chief of Police William Sears to prepare a foreword for our program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There is something about a time bomb that always puts fear into the bravest of men. Yet in modern police work, cases such as we are about to hear occur much too frequently for comfort. In every case, some officer is the unsung hero of the hour. Such was the case with Captain Marshall Scrafford and his able assistants, Red O'Brien and Frank Himes. We probably will never know definitely how the crazed mind of the criminal in tonight's story arrived at the decision to attempt his crime. But we do know that the work of Captain Scrafford and his men saved many lives and probably kept this nation away from the verge of war. How they did this, we shall see as the program unfolds. Our story opens in a little town just beyond the Canadian border. Seated in a porch swing of a modest home, a man and a woman are talking. But why won't you marry me now? I told you my reason, Rolf. But that's no reason. I don't always intend being in my present circumstances. I hope not. Well, then let's get married as we planned months ago. Oh, please, Rolf. Can I make you understand? I don't want to marry you now. I'd much rather wait until you're more stable financially. That wouldn't mean you'd marry for money, would it? Rolf. Oh, I'm sorry. But I can't understand what money has to do with our love. Can't we fight our way together side by side? That's just the point. I don't want to fight. I'm in a home that's mine. Not an apartment today and a rooming house tomorrow. Everything tailor-made, is that it? Well, putting it very bluntly, yes. Well, if you love me as much as you say you do, you'll go out and get the things I want. All right, if that's the way you want it. I'll show you. I'll make money. I'll get it some way. He should be here any minute. Perhaps the honorable gentleman has changed his mind. I think not. He desires of making much money. However, if he... Ah, our visitor has arrived. Hmm. January 20th already. Another sheet torn from the calendar. Christmas again before I know it. Homicide Bureau, Captain Scrafford. A ship is going to be blown up tonight. Hello? Hello? This is Scrafford of the Homicide Bureau speaking. Listen carefully to me. Go ahead, I'm listening. 
A ship's going to be blown to kingdom come tonight. This is the first one. There's going to be others. Everyone that's carrying scrap iron for war material. Tell them to get out of this country and stay out. Remember, this is only the first one. I didn't quite hear what you said. Ah, nuts, he hung up. And so begins the story of Ralph Forsyth. Meantime, Captain Marshal Strafford sat with flushed face musing over the strange telephone call. In the office with him is W.J. O'Brien. Doesn't make sense, I tell you. Of course it doesn't. There's some crank. Yeah, maybe, but just the same, I got a hunch it wasn't phony. The guy was trying to disguise his voice. If it wasn't for the bombing of the Panay a few months ago, I wouldn't think so much of it. Well, that's what makes me think it's just some crank. Well, the operator couldn't trace the call either. Oh, forget it. Go and get a glass of beer. Wonder what you blow a ship up with? Dynamite? Yeah, I suppose so. Couldn't very well do it with firecrackers. Yeah. Must put it down in the boiler room or drop it on the deck from a plane. Or float it alongside on a raft. Come on, let's get a beer. Float it alongside. That's it. That's the way they'll do it. O'Brien, well, we're going to stop this bombing. Say, are you nuts? Cut the clowning and listen. 99 chances out of 100, it was a crank calling, but it's that one chance we've got to investigate. Okay, Chief, I'm with you. We'll have to investigate every ship in the harbor and patrol the beach and docks. wonder what ship it'll be, if any. Give me that paper, I'll tell you in a minute. Let's see. Yeah, well, there's a president liner and two ships that might be possibilities. Uh, we'll have them all looked over. I think it's safe to eliminate the President Liner and one of the other ships is in dry dock, so that really only leaves the High A. Maru. The High A. Maru, huh? Yeah. Say, that's the one that's being loaded with scrap iron, too. That must be the one. Yeah, they're loading with scrap iron down at the Great Northern Dock. I'll go over there right away. Hines can meet me there. Wait a minute. I want Dick Mahoney and Ernie Winters to look over the High A. Maru. You and Himes get down to the President Liner. There's a possibility they might be loading scrap iron, too. Okay, Captain. I guess I better send McCarthy and Hemler to make the rounds of the hardware stores and find out where the dynamite came from if any's been bought. Maybe we can get a description of the bombers that way. What about the airport? I'll have them watch, too, and I'll get going. I got a lot of phoning to do. Well, I'll let you know if I find anything. Phone in here every hour, whether you find anything or not. Okay. Operator. Uh, connect me with Captain Tony Norton of the uniform division. Crazy fools. There's no telling what the... Hello, Tony. Yeah, this is Scrafford. I want six prowl cars down at the docks at 7 o'clock. Yeah. Six at seven. Some crazy fool's going to try to blow a ship out of the harbor. Huh? I don't know what time. Tonight's all I know, and it's up to us to stop him. And so began a feverish search for the dynamite and the owner of the voice on the phone. It was impossible to know what time the bombing was to take place. Every second counted. Captain Scrafford sat at his desk, every nerve tense, waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for reports, waiting for the sound of an explosion. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And then in quick succession reports began coming in. Scrafford speaking. Oh, hello, Mac. What'd you find? Nothing. You've been to all the hardware stores? Have you checked to see if there's been any dynamite stolen? Try the CCC camps? Yeah, that's a good idea. It might have been bought in Tacoma. Try that. Scrafford. Everything quiet on the High Maru, huh? We'll stay there and don't let anything get past you. Yeah, yeah, I suppose the captain has received a lot of threats, but this one may be the real McCoy. Time, that precious element relentlessly slipped by. Every tick of the clock bringing death closer and closer. Every second lost bringing destruction nearer. At five o'clock, there was still no news. And then a few minutes later... Homicide Bureau, Scrafford. What? You found it? Good work, Mac. Give me all the dope. Yeah? Let me get this straight. Two men walked into a hardware store in Tacoma. I'd like to buy some dynamite. Sure. How much do you want? Oh, about 2,000 ticks. 
What are you going to use it for, mister? Well, me and my buddy here intend to make a little money blasting stumps at Lacey. Yeah. Oh, blasting stumps at Lacey. Two thousand be enough? Enough to start. We'll be back if we need any more. Well, who's going to sign for it, you or him? Well, I ain't got nothing to do with it. You sign. Of course. Where will we sign? Right here. Hugh McLean. How are you going to carry this stuff, Mr. McLean? We've got a room just down the street. We can carry it that far. There'll be a truck pick it up tomorrow. Mm, you'll have to make several trips. I'd help you if I could leave oh, the store. Oh, that's all right. Come on, son. Grab on to some of this. So there's no danger of it blowing up, is there? Not right this minute. Now, come on. We've got a lot of ground to cover for every second count. Did you trace him to the hotel? Good. What'd you find out there? Did you get a description of him? We're looking for a man named McLean. Hugh McLean. Got another fellow with him, a kid. We had a fellow registered here by that name, but he checked out already. Mind if we go up to his room? No, I guess not. And when he checked out, did he move several boxes? No. Seems to me all he had was a big trunk. Trunk, eh? Do you know where the trunk was going? Why, he checked it to Seattle by bus. I see. Well, we'll take a look at the room now. Sure, I'll go up with you. You didn't find anything in the room, huh? Nothing but the empty packing boxes the dynamite had come in. Yeah. Well, did you get a description of them? Good. Let's have it. Uh, give me McLean first. About 30 years old. Yeah. Got a little black mustache. Combs his hair straight back. Has a high forehead. Okay. Now how about the kid? Mm-hmm. Looks kind of dumb, but don't say much. Yeah. Go on. Got long, dark hair that's supposed to be combed, but sort of hangs down. Yeah, what else? Big mouth, round face, low forehead. Hmm. That all you got on him? Okay, Mac, nice work. Get back here as fast as you can. I'll start checking from this end. It was now almost six o'clock, and every second counted. Captain Scofford phoned officers McCarthy and Heimler aboard the Haya Maru and informed them of the latest developments. Then began a search for the trunk. Finally, in a cheap rooming house. You receive a trunk here from Tacoma under the name of McLean? Yeah. Where is it now? Lord, I don't know. Man came and got it. Yeah? How did he take it away? Well, I don't just remember. Well, think hard, man. This is a matter of life and death. Well, now, don't rush me. I'm trying to think. Was it a transfer company or maybe a private truck? Every second counts. Well, let's see. Him and a young kid come and carried it out that door over there. There's always a lot of taxi cabs waiting out there at the side. They must have took it away in a cab. In a cab, huh? Thanks, mister. Did you take a trunk away from the depot about an hour ago? Nope, not me. You remember taking a trunk from the station? When? Tonight, just a little while ago. Not tonight, mister. I don't remember hauling any trunks for about a week. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Hey, buddy, you haul any trunks recently? Not me, sir. I'm trying to find a cab driver that hauled a trunk. Like me. Did oh, you haul a trunk me. tonight, Mr. Knight? No. Did you haul a trunk? No, sir. Hey, you, did you oh, haul a trunk? Time. The seconds leap into minutes. The minutes stretch into hours. At 8 o'clock, Officer McCarthy located the cab driver and was taken to the hotel where the trunk had been left. Finding the room locked, the two officers break down the door. Once more, together. Now. Well, there's the trunk. Be careful, careful. Don't handle it rough. Don't worry, Mac. Hey, it's not even locked. Well, open it. Empty. Well, we're too late. Hey, look over there on the table, Mac. Yeah, this is the place, all right. Ah, they must have made the bomb here. Here's a brace and several bits, a pair of calipers, and a pocket compass. Wonder what that's for. Search me. Here's some insulated wire, an electric buzzer. Oh, that must have been detected with. Yeah. Here's the battery. And here's the rest of the alarm clock, the parts they didn't need, huh? Yeah, here's a good pair of pliers, too. Well, there isn't much else we can get out of this place. We'll call Scrafford and then get down to the dock. That's where the fun's going to be. <laughs> While the mad search for the dynamite had been going on, two men stood on the beach. The icy waters of Puget Sound creeping in near their feet. The muffled sound of boats in the harbor is a symphony of deep-throated whistles and multi-toned bells. The taller of the two men is slowly undressed. 
Well, it won't be long now. I don't like this business. Well, what have you got to worry about? You're not taking any chances. Well, maybe not, but if we get caught... I'll cut it. Take these clothes and put them over there under the dock. I think you're nuts to swim in that water in the middle of January. Well, how would you do it? Well, take a boat and paddle out to the high Amaro. Yeah? Take a chance of being seen? <laughs> you're stupider than I thought you were. Uh, I'll have to swim it. You're liable to get cramped. I don't think so. I've been swimming every day, hardening myself to it. Hey, you got the suitcase fastened to the railroad tie? Mm-hmm. Everything's all set. Okay, here I go. I'm scared, Ross. Well, then get out of here. Go back to the room and wait for me. So let's drop the whole thing. Them guys might not pay you. Oh, yes, they will. A thousand dollars for each one that's blown up. Yeah, I know. A thousand dollars is a lot of money. It'll help. Tell you what you do, Joe. Huh? There's some boxcars over on that side, and why don't you go over there and sleep for a while? Okay, Ross. Gosh, I... I hope everything goes all right. Don't worry. Everything will. Won't that dumb cop by phone get the surprise of his life about 1.30? Cop? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, nothing. I, I phoned the captain of the homicide division and told him a ship was going to be blown sky high tonight. Oh, holy gee, Forsyth. What did you do that for? I don't like coppers. Oh, forget it. Tomorrow morning, the papers will carry a full page with pictures. We'll be famous. But, but I don't want to be famous. And besides, you won't know who done it. Just the same. At least I'll have the personal satisfaction of having done my part. All right, now. Get going and keep out of sight. Well, good luck. Thanks. Oh. Pretty slick. Phone the police and then bomb the ship out of the harbor right under their nose. Oh, boy, this water's cold. But here goes. I can't sink when I'm hanging on to this railroad tie. But I'm going to make a lot of money. I don't want to marry you now. I'd much rather wait until you're more stable financially. Well, I still can't see what money has to do with our love. I don't want to fight. I want a home that's mine, not an apartment today and a rooming house tomorrow. I don't intend always being my present circumstances. Oh, but if you love me as much as you say you do, you'll go out and get the things I want. All right, if that's the way you want it, I'll show you. I'll make money. I'll get it some way. A thousand dollars. And all I have to do is to blow up the ships you tell me to? A thousand dollars a ship. I'll show you. I'll make money. I can't marry you unless you make some money. A thousand dollars for every ship you blow up. You'll drown. The water's too cold. I'll make money somehow. Some way. I'll show her. Make money and I'll marry you. A thousand dollars. You'll die in the attempt. Make money. A thousand You'll dollars. die. I've got to make it. I'll marry you. I've got to. All the money you You'll need. never make, make it. Money. A thousand dollars. The water's too money. cold. Money. Thousand You'll money. die in your life to get away. Seconds fleeting, detectives searching, and still no sign of the bomb. Coast Guard cutters parted the waters of the sound. Searchlights played a weird fantasy on the dark waters. And then the silence of Scrafford's office was broken by the jangle of the phone bell. Scrafford speaking. Call to car 11. What'd you find? A kid, huh? Good, I'll be right down. Now we're getting someplace. <laughs> Here he is. I ain't done nothing. Let me go. Okay, son. But first, I want to know what you meant telling these officers your pal had gone swimming. Well, I didn't mean nothing. He, he went swimming. That's all I know. Where'd you pick him up, McCarthy? Well, the boys found him in a freight car and brought him over here. You gave orders to pick up everybody around the dock. Have you searched him? No, yeah, there's nothing on him. We asked him what he was doing down here, and he said he's waiting for a friend. We asked him where his friend was, and <laughs> he said he's swimming. It sounded phony to us, so we called you. Good work. What's your name? Uh, Port. George Park. What's your pal's name? I, I don't know. You don't know. Don't lie to me. Well, it, it's Forsythe. Ross Forsythe. I, I met him in a beer joint. What about this swimming in the sound in January? Well, he, he got drunk and insisted on going swimming. I tried to talk him out of it, but I, I couldn't. Did he wear all his clothes when he went in? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, no. No, they're, they're over there under the dock. I'll try to go see if you can find him. Okay. You know anything about a bombing tonight? For me? Yeah, you. No. No, I ain't heard nothing about it. You're lying. No, I ain't. Honest, I ain't. I don't know what you're talking about. Why did you and your pal buy 2,000 sticks of dynamite in Tacoma? Well, answer me. I don't know nothing. Let me go. Oh, let me go. Get back there. <laughs> no, let me go. I don't know nothing. Honest, I don't. Uh, here's a man's clothes, all right. They were under the dock, like he said. These belong to your pal? Yeah. Yeah, that's them. 
How long ago did he go swimming? Well, I don't know. I've been asleep in the freight car. Well, he's out there someplace, and he's got the bomb with him. Tell the cutters to look closer. Okay, Chief. What time is that bomb set to go off, Bart? I don't know nothing. Okay, you don't know nothing. But listen to me a minute. There's a man swimming out there someplace with dynamite, and he intends blowing up a ship. Do you realize what will happen if he succeeds? No. I'll tell you. Thousands of innocent people will be killed, all because a crazy fool didn't think what he was doing. Now listen, kid. If you know anything about this, tell us. We're not going to hurt you. Come on. 133. It's going off at 133. Good Lord, it's 1130 now. 133. He tested it with a buzzer, and it, it always went off at 133. How was he going to blow it up? Well, it's all in a suitcase and tied to a railroad tie. He swam out to tie it onto the propeller of the ship. There's 369 sticks. The rest is in Tacoma, hidden. All right, boys, take him to headquarters. All right, come Where's on. Where's O'Brien? Right here, Chief. Get Himes, and the two of you get on out one on one of those cutters. We've got to find Forsyth, or whatever his name is. We'll find him. Search every inch of this beach for more dynamite. There's, there's only 369 sticks in this bomb. The rest is probably around here somewhere. Maybe it's in Tacoma, like the kid said, but we can't take any chances. What about the higher room? Uh, I'll take care of that. Get going. Okay. McCarthy, get some divers here as quick as you can. We've got to search the keel of that ship. We haven't a second to lose. I'll have him here in a jiffy. Let's see. What else? Cutters searching the water. Yeah. Well, there's nothing to do but wait and pray. The frantic search was on. Somewhere in the murky waters of Puget Sound was a man swimming with 369 sticks of powerful dynamite. It was now almost 12 o'clock. Scrafford was beside himself. The attempted bombing must be stopped. The seconds pushed relentlessly on. 12.30. One more hour. And then a signal from the Coast Guard cutter G6. Scrafford rushed out into the dock to greet it and hear the news. Good work, men. Captain Scrafford, take a look what we found. Oh. Floating face down about 100 yards from shore. Forsyth. Must have had cramps or a bad heart. Been dead about two hours. That's him, all right. Dark, with a black mustache, high forehead, intelligent face. Mm -hmm. Poor guy. But the dynamite, no trace of it. Holy smoke, no telling where it's floating. We got to find it. It goes off at 1.33. No telling me. That's less than an hour. Comb every inch of the water. Keep those searchlights plenty busy. One o'clock, and still no trace of the missing bomb. One ten. The search was at a fever pitch. One fifteen. Eyes ached, heads throbbed. One twenty, and Captain Scrafford gave orders to clear the sound. The crew of the Haya Maru abandoned ship. No craft was permitted to get within several hundred feet of the troubled area. Scrafford, O'Brien, and Himes stand, watches in hand, waiting for the detonation coming at one thirty-three. Three minutes to go. Poor Scythe got what was coming to him, all right. I wonder what they'll do with the kid. I don't know, Himes. I don't think he knows so much about it. Poor Scythe was the brains. Apparently, he made the connection with the higher-ups. It's the higher-ups that ought to be caught. Yeah, don't worry about that, O'Brien. They'll be caught sooner or later. Two minutes to go. It's 1.31 on the dot. Wish they'd hurry up and blow. The suspense is getting me. Me, too. The kid must have told the truth about the rest of it being in Tacoma. The boys didn't find any of it around here. Of course, I seem to have plenty of money. Yet I checked on him, like you asked. And he isn't supposed to have any. And his boss has furnished him with all he needed to get the dynamite. I wonder how much he was to get for blowing up these ships. Whatever it was, he'll never collect it now. It's 1.32. One more minute. Get ready for the explosion. I'll feel the shock for miles around. Yeah, we better lie down or we'll be knocked down. It's a shame Forsyth had to die like that. It's too good for him. Yeah. All right. Get set. Here it goes. Say, it's past 133. That's funny. Maybe the kid was lying. Well, it might have been. It's coming up 134. Maybe something went wrong with the clock. Yeah, it's possible. Might be any number of things. I don't think it's going off. Me neither. I feel like a big load been lifted off my chest. Something sure went wrong. I think the kid was telling the truth. Forsyth miscalculated some way. Which means it might still go off if jarred. Well, anyway, that's all for tonight. No use risking lives unnecessarily. We'll get the hunt going tomorrow. 
Get word to the rest and let's fold up. I'm a nervous wreck. The search was called off for the night to be taken up early in the morning. Every precaution was used as the floating dynamite would be a constant menace until found. Late the next afternoon, down into the dock, officers O'Brien and Himes noticed a dark object just below the surface of the water. Rowing close, they discovered the suitcase with its deadly contents. Carefully lifting it from the water, they carried it to nearby mud flats, where it could be safely opened. O'Brien and Himes volunteered to open the bomb. Well, say your prayers, mister. I'm not scared, are you, O'Brien? Me? Of course not. Playing with dynamite's nothing to me. Why well, to eat it when I was a baby. Mm-hmm. I'm grown up now. Let's open it. Sooner the better. Scrape the tar off the catches and don't breathe. Seems to me we'd better breathe all we can now. Maybe in a few minutes we'll be able to. There, I'll use the catch open. Boy, sounded like an explosion of sound. Get the other one. Don't rush me. I understand. I'm not scared. I'm just cautious. Here. Ease that lid up. If you've never been gentle in your life, be gentle now. All right. Hold on. Here it goes. Hinges rusted already. Look, there it is. 369 sticks of dynamite. Hey, for the love of Pete, cut those wires and do it quick. It's a cinch. Hey, will you look at the face of that clock? Soaking wet. It's all swelled up. And that swelling stopped the minute hand of the clock. At exactly 1.31. Just two minutes more. In just a moment, we shall hear the concluding facts of our story. During this brief interval, may I say the verdict rendered by an impartial jury at the bar of public opinion is that Rio Grande Cracked is the gasoline of all-around police car performance. That its colleague in maximum motoring efficiency is Rio Lube, the 100% paraffin-based motor oil that withstands any engine heat or cold weather and sells for but a quarter a quart at your Rio Grande dealers. <laughs> attempt to bomb Lahaye Maru, Forsyth paid with his life. Federal agents are seeking the men who employed him, and his companion has been held to answer for his part in the plot. Definitely, the crime of Ralph Forsyth failed to pay. Calling all cars, attention all cars to cancellation on broadcast 257 regarding a bombing. Suspect in this case drowned in Puget Sound. That is all, Harmon. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night. For Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present the case of the Portuguese crooner. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.